like probably in a couple seconds. It'll it'll let you. Oh yeah, we're live now. <laughs> I did the best that I could. <laughs> it looks great. And you look great, which is what's most important. <laughs> Thank you. So Mabula, we anticipate that we are going to have a number of uh, participants, seminar participants today from your Chicago, and many of them are going to come from uh, the Women's Languages Department, and many of them are going to come from uh, CSRPC. So an interesting yeah. group. Yes. Okay, we have 21 participants. Uh, Sierra, do you think we should get started or should we wait another minute before we do? Yeah, we can wait another minute to see if more folks join. Sounds good. Ça va, Noémie, ça se passe bien à la fin du semestre? Oups. Sorry, pardon, ma boule. La fin de semestre, ça se, ça se passe bien, ça se passe dans l'urgence, comme d'habitude, <laughs> mais, mais ça se passe bien. Okay. Et puis ça se termine avec toi alors. Glorious, glorious ending. <laughs> c'est gentil, c'est gentil. OK. I think we can probably get started now. So hello, everybody. Good morning. Thank you for uh, joining us for this conversation and this uh, book launch with Dr. Mabula Sumaoro. Uh, today's event is generously sponsored by the Center for the Study of Race, Politics, and Culture, the Department of Romance Languages and Literatures, and the France Chicago Center here at the University of Chicago. I'd like to thank in particular uh, Angel Torres Guevara for creating our beautiful poster, uh, Tara Kilpatrick for handling the Zoom logistics of this event, making everything possible, and Jennifer Hurtarte uh, from Romance Languages for carefully overseeing this project. And most importantly, of course, I want to thank our guest, Dr. Mabula Sumauro, for uh, taking the time to join us today from, from Paris, right? This is where from you are. Montpellier, actually. <laughs> Montpellier, even better. <laughs> Brief introductions. Uh, Mabula Sumaoro is an associate professor in the English department at the Université François Rabelais in Tours, France, and at the Paris Institute of Political Science. Her research focuses on US and African American studies, the African diaspora, and Atlantic Black nationalisms. During the many years that she spent in the US, she taught at Bennington College, which has a particular place in her heart, Barnard College, the Bard Prison Initiative, and Columbia University. Based in France, Sumaoro is the president of the Black History Month organization, and she is an appointed member of the National Committee for uh, the Memory and History of Slavery. She is one of the recipients of the brand new Villa Albertine Fellowship program, which is sponsored by the Cultural Services of the French Embassy. And so as a result, she is currently in residence in Atlanta for the next three months. Well, right now she's in Montpellier, but she will uh, fly back to Atlanta shortly. The focus of her residency is the adaptation of her latest book in partnership with the Théâtre du Nord. And here I, I quote uh, from the Villa Albertine website, this adaptation will not be an exclusively linguistic project, but the text will be the starting point for creating a multimedia performance that will embrace speech and discourse, languages, imagery, sound, arts, academic and popular knowledge, and political, personal, and intimate questions in order to probe the three-dimensional nature of the triangle on which I have reflected and written, but above all, above all to which I belong." Unquote. Dr. Sumauro was awarded the Fitkan Literary Prize for her book, Le Triangle et l'Hexacone, 
Réflexion sur une identité noire, which was published by les éditions de la Découverte in 2020, and which was just translated as Black is the Journey Africana, the name by uh, Polity 2022. The book is now available, the, the English version, uh, Black is the Journey, Africana, the name, is now available for purchase. You can order it. Uh, and I will point out that Dr. Sumauru assembled a dream team for the US release of this book. Uh, it was translated by Kayama Glover uh, from Barnard College, whom you have known for over 20 years since graduate school, uh, apparently. Uh, and it was prefaced by uh, the one and only Sadia Hartman, whose work was very important to your own intellectual development. Um, you have some very moving pages where you translate into French passages from Lose Your Mother, which is otherwise not available in French at the moment. And you close read her, te her text, and then she prefaced your text. So you we have all those, those layers of mutuality, of sustained engagement and, and care across diasporic lines, uh, which in my opinion makes this book really a, a black feminist paradise. <laughs> so Hartman describes your book in her foreword as I quote, an autobiography of reading, a critical memoir that also gestures to a self shaped and created by reading practices, and more specifically, a self engendered by diaspora liter literacy. In this memoir of intellectual formation, you give us a sense of what it is like to move in the world, let's say the world, <laughs> uh, and to come of age as you, a Black French woman whose dialectical itinerary starts in France as a racialized person subjected to intersectional oppression in an officially colorblind and adamantly universalist country that refuses to even talk about race. And then, Antithèse, you move to the US, uh, you spend 10 years there discovering, studying, metabolizing, and teaching the American paradigms of Black studies. And then, Synthèse, you come back uh, to France, and there you, um, you face head on this, this reality, the reality of Blackness within a French paradigm and you decide to put the spotlight on it. So this biography that you give us is that of an intellectual and of an activist who finds the language to see, to understand, to choose, and to embrace Blackness. So for me, also a Black French woman in academia, reading this book was uh, quite a unique experience because I recognized so much of my own uh, experience in it and what you describe, with differences, of course, uh, informed by the weight of colorism in France, which is, is not something the book focuses on, but is, <clears throat> is very real. And of course, mm -hmm. my decision to, to stay in the US. But this is the book, which I've been telling everybody I know in France, everybody who never quite understood what I was talking about, what my life was about, or anybody who could not really measure the gap between my life and theirs, and between my life in the US and my life in France, I've just been telling them for the last two years to read this book. When I get the sense of disconnection, I tell people, Maboula explains it all. Just, just read the book. It's luminous, 140 pages. Go for it. So thank you for uh, producing this amazing resource. It's a book that is really important and uh, I hope will feature on many French college uh, syllabi in the future. Um, The, the today's event is going to be structured as follows. Uh, Mabula is going to make some opening uh, brief remarks about, about the book, about her work. Um, and then I will ask her a few questions for about half an hour. And then we'll have another half hours for uh, questions from the seminar uh, participants. So please uh, feel free to drop any questions you might have in the chat. There will be uh, plenty of time uh, for Dr. Sumohu to address them. And with that, I am going to go quiet and uh, yield the floor to Dr. Sumohu. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ndiaye. Uh, thank you for the invitation. Um, I, don't, um, I haven't given up the idea of meeting you in person, so I know it will happen at some point in life. Um, thank you for your for your reading, your close reading, and I have to say that um, um, not long, not too long after the the, the book was published in um, in in France and in French, uh, we had a conversation, and you were telling me about how you wanted to uh, to invite me to the University of Chicago, and how you uh, um, you know there are certain passages that we 
closely read and discussed together. So, so thank you for, for your trust and your support and, um, yeah, and for your reading, <laughs> enlightened reading. So I want to say a few words uh, in opening, perhaps to frame the conversation about um, this book, talking about its uh, genealogy, uh, how it came into being, and, and perhaps what it means today um, to have it um, exist in both on, on those two sides of the Atlantic, as to say, um, on, on the French side on the one hand, and on the American side on the um, on the other. The American being the U.S. right now, but um, I do make a difference, as many of us do, uh, between the U.S. and the rest of the Americas, right? So I'll be more specific about that. Uh, <clears throat> So Le Triangle de l'Hexagone is the original title in, in French, and it means the triangle and the hexagon. Uh, the hexagon is a common way to designate France uh, from France and from hexagonal France. France, um, in terms of cartography, of geography, is supposed to resemble a hexagon. It's supposed to have six sides. And this is one way to teach the geography of France when you go to public primary school um, you know, in France. So if you use the term hexagon with a capitalized H, people will know that you're talking about France, right? The French Republic, the nation state France. Um, so I was playing on this um, you know, familiar term, very common term, um, perhaps to put into light the fact that France is not a hexagon is not only a hexagon. This uh, six side shape of France uh, that is located in Europe is only one portion of France. If you look at the ensemble of the, the French Republic, then you find um, territories that are located outside of, of the hexagon. Think of Corsica, for instance, and outside of Europe. Right, you have a, a French presence in the Atlantic Ocean, the, the area that I'm specializing in, but also in the Indian Ocean and in the Pacific Ocean. Right, so there are more Frances than this mere hexagon. So, uh, to, to 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 that notion of hexagon and to that challenging of the notion of hexagon, I added the triangle, which was, um, of course, a direct reference to you know, the trans transatlantic slave trade to the modern era, uh, also to the Black Atlantic of Paul Geroy, um, a notion that is less familiar in the French hexagonal context and that I wanted to, um, you know, to, to, to bring closer to the hexagon. So I have to say that um, uh, the title in French was not autom automatically accepted by the publishing house who feared uh, some level of obscurity, you know, if the goal is to market the book and to have, you know, potential readers pick up the book and choose it uh, from other titles, they thought that the title was not catchy enough, um, which I contested because I think I'm good at catchy titles. Uh, I love all my titles. <laughs> um, but uh, they said, no, more seriously, what they said was that the hexagon was familiar and the triangle was not. And so they were afraid that people might not recognize or might not be able to identify what the book would actually be about. And then, so I, I felt that um, if, if that's the readership that they had in mind, then it was really high time that we, we got to know this, this triangle. So I hand, held on to my title and, and the compromise was about adding a subtitle, Réflexion sur une identité noire, reflections on a black identity uh, because they were they wanted to play with Jean-Paul Sartre reflection sur la question juive uh, I had to compromise again and say I don't want a D I want an A because I don't know what the black identity is I can only contribute to the reflection on what a black identity can be based on my own and based on my on my knowledge of the the scholarship produced on the African diaspora but they were more comfortable with you know the um, familiar again uh, figure of Jean-Paul Sartre la question juive uh, um, I mean, Jean-Paul Sartre, the Jewish question in France, reflections on anti-Semitism, um, you know, a trend, a history, a notion that has been explored in France, uh, say more recently and in a more accepted manner, at least since the Second World War. When, when you're talking about race and blackness, for instance, uh, these are supposed to be novel questions 
not established questions, not legitimate question. So perhaps they sought to reassure um, you know, the average reader or the average critique and say, you know, look, wink, wink to Jean-Paul Sartre, wink, wink to reflection on the Jewish question. And, um, you know, we would offer you a reflection on a black identity because our author didn't want to let go uh, of, of this A and, and did not accept the third. So, so that's the, the genealogy of the title that I wanted to say a few words on because I think that it, 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 uh, it does capture you know, uh, um, you know, different dynamics that are to be understood and that are uh, to, um, uh, you know, to be grasped if we if we get into uh, if we want to get uh, deep into what the book is about. So the book is really a sort of autobiography until uh, Cedia Hartman's uh, preface. I didn't know that I was writing an autobiography. I was offering um, a reflection on my own trajectory as um, you know, a person that had come of age as black after years and decades, after times passing, after lots of traveling across the, the Atlantic. Um, across the Atlantic because my family is from the Ivory Coast, West Africa, and migrated to France um, you know, in the 1960s, that is to say in the post-war uh, you know, moment, post-Second World War moment, post-colonial moment moment even. Uh, so my, in, in that, my family is really, uh, you know, average and common, you know, there are millions of people coming from the former colonies after the Second World War who uh, migrated to France. I was born in Paris, France, and um, where I grew up, and then later on in my life, as Dr. Ndiaye, uh, you know, um, explained earlier, I went to the United States where I studied and taught and spent a lot of time. And from the United States, I also traveled throughout the Americas, uh, the Caribbean and Latin America. So it took me a while to understand that I was navigating the Black Atlantic that I had studied <laughs> for so long <laughs> since the book was published in 1993. Um, and, and I began uh, you know, traveling between the African continent, but mainly Europe and the Americas in the late, from the late 90s on, right? So it took me a while to, uh, to understand what I was doing. And it took me a while to establish the connection between my object of study, that is to say African studies, the African diaspora of the Americas and myself. It took me a while as an individual to understand that um, I was part of, the, of this diaspora. There's a reason for that uh, because my experience of immigration is, is totally different if you compare it to the experience of immigration, uh, you know, in the transatlantic, um, transatlantic uh, slave trade context, totally different. I come, I'm, I'm one generation away from the Ivory Coast. I still have a very clear idea of my genealogy. Um, I, uh, you know, I have, uh, you know, parents, we know where we come from. We, you know, there's a whole thing, it's present. And for the longest time, mistakenly, I thought that um, I was not a migrant. I was not a migrant. I was born in Paris. My parents were migrants, but then I, I went to the Americas and I became a migrant myself. So the same questions began to pop up in my head. Where is home? Where do you return? Where are you from? Where is your, what is your mother tongue? What language is, uh, you know, do, do you speak? Should you speak? Should you pass down? What is your culture? And then you find out that you already have multiple locations in the story. Whether they are, you know, very blurry or not very blurry is not is not the point. It's just that it's multiple. And from the very beginning, there is France in my life. There is Paris, France, and then, and there is the Ivory Coast. And then there is the third space that I chose to my uh, for myself. People move for different reasons. People move for because they have to, uh, because they are forced, uh, because of economic or political reasons, and also because of choice. So I chose to move to the Americas, but I still moved. So it, it, it actually brings up the same question. So that's, uh, you know, when I realized all that, uh, it made me insert myself um, in these Africana things, Africana matters that I had already uh, began, um, began to explore throughout time. And it led me to uh, do a, a return on myself and to allow myself to, you, to use my story and to understand or perhaps to fathom 
my story to see what it means to um you know to be a, a black uh, the descendant of African black migrants in the you know late 20th century and 21st century in the French context in the French context because as um, uh, Dr. Ndiaye said at the beginning we're talking about when talking about France um, an environment that is not too keen on <laughs> talking about racial matters uh, um, you know in the in the discourse in politics this is the, the, I'm not saying that racial matters do not exist in the French context. I'm just saying that if you compare them to the, if you compare that context to that of the United States, it's a totally different way to operate, totally different, which doesn't mean that uh, we're not dealing the same questions where we, it, it's really, I mean, the, the, the example of France uh, can give us a very important and telling illustration of, of the need to accept the diversity and the variations of the you know the the dealings with race with race within the African diaspora, the United States is not France, uh, which is not the UK, which is not Brazil, which is not Argentina. So if if we we have this you know macro level understanding of this African diaspora of the Black Atlantic of the transatlantic move you know moment and its uh, consequences, then we can move on. And, and and I think the question is about striking the right balance between the macro level and the micro level. So we have the global um, you know, histories and, and cultures and politics, and then we get to the, the, the micro level and that would be the national history, uh, the, the, the specificity of each location. So in that regard, France is a very particular place and, and France, whether uh, the, the Republic likes it or not, is part of this African diaspora and um, has produced uh, racial categories, has produced blackness. And I happen to be one of, uh, you know, one of the descendants of, of that history. So this is what I wanted to, um, um, to explain, to put forth, to write about in the book. And, um, you know, as I said earlier, perhaps use my own experience, allow myself to use my own experience as a legitimate experience, and, and not only to tell my story, but to uh, analyze my story in light of the scholarship around the African diaspora that I know of and that, I, that it took me so long to realize that I was part of, that it was not only a, an object of study, it was, it was actually uh, my life too. So I think this, this is what I can say uh, knowing me on, on on this book as an introduction, but I do speak a lot, so you need to stop me, otherwise we'll be here. <laughs> I would not dare. <laughs> Thank you. This this was really helpful, uh, Mabula. And I, one quick comment I want to make is, I, I heard the recurrent phrase: "It took some time. It took some time to realize to go through this journey." I want to emphasize that this is this was also the case for me, and I think this is the case for most. French folks uh, who are of sub-Saharan descent. Um, mm -hmm. I, I remember having conversations in, in recent years, as I had started my own journey being in the US, engaging with this conceptual apparatus, um, I remember having conversations with old friends from French high school, uh, including friends who were racialized, right? Who were Métis just like me, and who did yeah. not quite get it because the French cultural conditioning is so deep that it really, <laughs> it takes some work to, um, to, to, to get out of it. You, you need the tool, right? You talk a lot about the, the tool. And my hope is that your book being out there as, a, as an available resource will make it easier for the next generation to get that faster, right? It will take less time. <laughs> for, 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 for my hope. This is my um, hope, like for people to understand, uh, uh, you know, to become aware faster than than I did or that, that than we did, uh, and to not have to go away, uh, not have to exile themselves. So, so that that's the goal. Like I totally agree with you. Perhaps. So I have a, a bunch of questions for you, but the the first one actually I think goes, you know, is right in line with with what you were describing. I'm just trying to uh, get a little more uh, background for our mm -hmm. seminar participants uh, about what the situation is like in France. So in Le Triangle et l'Hexagone, uh, you make it vividly clear that 2006 was a turning point, right, for the eruption of blackness and race as 
topics of inquiry, urgent topics uh, that needed to be, discord, to, to be discussed in public discourse in the public sphere. And the public sphere here is both political. Uh, you mentioned Les, Le Parti des Indigènes de la République, uh, the foundation of the CRAN, which is uh, um, which fights for uh, the Black cause in France. So that, that's the political sphere. And then we have the academic sphere with the publication of scholarship by sociologists, political scientists like uh, Eric Fassin, Didier Fassin, and uh, Pap Ndiaye's La Condition Noire, which is very important. So 2006 was a turning point. And that was 15 years ago. Uh, since then, you have become a very visible figure in the French media and in the world of activism since you created uh, Les Journées Africana. So I'm wondering from, your, from your, your, your vantage point as both an activist and a, a scholar, what has happened over the last 15 years, right? 15 years later, where are we on the subject? Mm -hmm. I think you're, you're, you're absolutely right to highlight the, you know, the dates, um, if I may, it's going to be 2006 and 2005, right? Those two years, 2005, because of what was called the riots or the, you know, the, the, the revolts of the, 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 the underprivileged uh, suburbs, la, la banlieue. And then, because it was at, at the end of the year, it began, it began in late October of 2005, of course, we have the 2006 that follows and with uh, a lot of consequences from that year. Um, so where are we now 15, 16 years later? I think a lot has happened. It's, it's, it's incre incredible to see, but then again, it's also logical. Uh, you know, the death of those two kids um, in Clichy sous Bois, uh, the, the, the two kids I'm talking about who, who were running, uh, Ziad Bena and Buna Traoré, who were trying to escape the police, who wanted to do a, uh, you know, uh, identity check, and who um, who sought to hide in a sub sub uh, power station, and who got electrocuted uh, bad. When I say bad, I, th I think I'm going to spend some time on those details because they do matter. When we get this news we can either receive it as two teenagers, uh, one was 15, one was 17, 17 get killed uh, uh, because they electrocuted themselves in clichy sous bois meaning in Saint-Saint-Denis, the poorest uh, department in hexagonal France, uh, home of all the migrants, home of all the problems, socioeconomic problems. And then those, those kids were running away from the police what had they done, you know, like serves them right, they're dead. That's one way to receive the news. The other way to receive the news is to uh, carry out investigation and research. So I did go with uh, Dr. Trika Kiran. I, I did go to Clichy sous Bois just a few months after those events that triggered, um, you know, the, the, the riots of 2005. And I met with the family. I met with some people from the neighborhood. I met with the social workers there who told me that uh, when the bodies of those kids were, because they were kids, five, 15 and 17, we're talking about children. Uh, when the bodies of those two kids were found, only the fathers were asked to come and to identify the bodies because the bodies were so burnt that you, they could not tell who was the guy from, uh, let's say, classic uh, Mauritanian origin, black appearing, and who was the guy classically of Tunisian origin, so meaning like a, um, a, a lighter, more mixed uh, feature. And so they, 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 they asked the fathers to come because they, they thought that it would be too harsh on, on, the, on the mothers or too harsh on the brothers and sisters. Uh, because you couldn't say, see who was the black one and who was the not also black one. And the fathers identified their, their, their respective children through their sneakers. It was the sneakers that were so bad. So to me, I'm, I'm, I'm spending that much time to um, perhaps try to share with you uh, what 2005 has meant for me. Um, at this time, I was, I was living between New York and Paris. I was mostly in New York. I was free in New York, studying in New York, you know, uh, discovering myself in New York. And then I'm, I'm, in, um, I'm in Paris. I happen to be in Paris. 
in October of 2005, this news bro uh, broke and I get obsessed with the story. And I'm, I'm, I'm obsessed because I come from the projects. I grew up in the projects. I grew up poor. I see the families of, uh, you know, Buna Traoré and Ziyed Bena, and I recognize my own families. I recognize, I know what it is to have, uh, you know, parents who do not speak French, parents you have to translate for, uh, uh, parents who sometimes were not educated, were not literate, so you fill out the forms, all the administrative bureaucratic forms for them, uh, you know, the clothing, uh, the imbalance in front of all the institutions, the, the lack of money, the lack of, you know, power. And I, I get obsessed with that story and, I, and, I, and, and uh, I write my first article for Transition on, on France um, under those particular circ circumstances. Before that, I was an Anglicist. I was specializing in US studies of African-American studies, not France. Uh, but at that point, it really was, um, I don't know, a sort of return, like who I am, who am I, who are we in this context? Who, who are the people who get killed like that? Who are the people who get killed so young? Who are the people who get racially profiled, uh, you know, automatically, consistently, you know, repeatedly? Uh, who are the people who live in, this, in, 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 the, in these projects, in these conditions? Uh, who are the people who get to become the objects of conversations in the news media? Uh, you, you know, like people will talk about, you know, polygamy, immigration, assimilation, and, and, and not dealing with, 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 with these people, with us as human beings. Um, so that's, that really was a turning point. But, but, but I think that at this time, it was still rare to have people of color uh, in mainstream media. It was still rare. And if there were, the, 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 if there were the few you could find, the rule was that they did not, of course, they embodied the, you know, the, the minority, but they should not have a discourse about being a minority. They were supposed to be, you know, perceived as a people of color, but people of color who were happy <laughs> about their situation on France and remained silent on this top topic. So there was no, not that many people that I would see that would, you know, in my view, voice my concerns or my in my interest. So I think that the the, the difference between then and now is that is that uh, now the conversation has become public. Uh, it has become public, and it also comes from the people who are um, you know um, concerned, the people who carry those bodies. Uh, the, pe the people who, 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 who experience those trajectories. So it's, it's more like, and it's precisely because th there is a, a greater presence in, you know, in the mainstream media, in politics, in public conversation, that the hostility, that the violence is, is, is are so high. Um, when the, 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 the order of things was so conf confident, was so locked, uh, that you know, people didn't need to talk to us. They didn't have to be that mean. To the, today, the meanness, uh, the the insistence, the repetitions is 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 actually proof of progress, because they didn't have to be that mean before. You know, I'm using mean. Um, you know, I'm I'm playing a little, but uh, they didn't have to be that openly violent in the words, in the policies. Um, you know, in the presidential platforms, uh, uh, you know, I think that was a switch really in the 2007 presidential elections with Nicolas Sarkozy. I think there really was um, a shift um, in, in, uh, in that, uh, you know, violence and, and, and need for protection and need to maintain the, the secular uh, French values that are centuries or, I mean, millennia old even. And, and that's precisely because there, there's been this real, realization of a demographic uh, change. Right. And as we enter presidential campaign time again <laughs> with, uh, with presidential elections uh, coming up this, this winter in France, we are seeing discourse heating up again uh, on, on various fronts and the fact that uh, Josephine Baker, 
was uh, entered into the French Pantheon uh, shows us that the government is aware of this, that race is a topic that cannot be evaded anymore. Uh, and, if, yes, and if I may, uh, Noemi, and Josephine yeah. Baker is so, I mean, her, her induction in the Pantheon is so important because it really shows, as you said, the at least the government's um, realization that there are some topics that can no longer be evaded and the, the attempt by the government to control the terms of the debate. If we cannot escape this conversation, we are going to control the conversation. So we are going to talk about race and blackness in that particular instance, and we are go going to induct the woman that we will have chosen a, a woman from the United States. I mean, there are lots of things to say about Baker, but we are going to try to control the term of the narratives so that we cannot be accused of not caring for those issues. But we're still not happy. That's Absolutely. not we're not happy about that choice. And Josephine so. Baker is a very in interesting case for thinking about you know transnational blackness relation, what it means to live between to live your blackness between the U.S. and France, and perhaps we can return to that case uh, yes. during, during the Q and A. But for now, I wanted to get us back to the book, to your book, uh, and to the question of translation, which is so central uh, to you. Translation is really the key word. At various points uh, in the book, you comment on everything that is lost is so easily lost in translation. Sadia Hartman's lost, Lose Your Mother is still not available in French. You, you have this very lengthy but really illuminating um, footnote on the mistranslations uh, that took place in the French translation of ta Code's essay, Between the World and Me, uh, but you also, you think about translation more capaciously, right, as a metaphor, you think about self-translation, you think about what is lost when French officials who might fund Les Journées Africaines cannot grasp your vision because they don't speak the same language, right, that, that's a metaphor you use, or, or you think about what is lost or self-depleted when uh, uh, BIPOC people need to perform the free emotional labor of translating their own experience over over and over again into terms that white people can understand but will refuse to understand at the end of the day anyway. So translation is really um, an important practice and organizing conceptual trope uh, for you. Uh, and, and of course, the, your residency uh, as part of the Villa Albertine is focused on adaptation as a form of translation. So my question is about the experience of having this book uh, translated into English, and more specifically, what do you think was lost and gained, because I think there is gain often in translation as well, uh, for this specific book? And maybe a good starting point to answer that question about what is lost and gained in translation might be the English title. You gave us that beautiful genealogy for the French title. Can you, can you tell us about the English title? Thank you. Yes, uh, the English title is mine. Um, I uh, <laughs> imposed it on uh, on poor <laughs> Dr. Kayama Glover, who uh, who accepted it. But it was mine uh, for some reason. Um, this is simply how it rang in my um, in my mind. Um, I, I knew I couldn't do, uh, of course, a, a literal translation. But sometimes literal translation do work in that in that in that. Uh, in that, in that particular context, it did not because um, um, if I said that in the French context, people might not, you know, potential readers might not be uh, familiar with the hexagon in an English uh, speaking context, I would assume that the people, the potential readers would not be familiar with the hexagon itself. Uh, they might know about the triangle, but not the hexagon, so it didn't make any sense. And if we approach translation as, you know, a, a will and an attempt, but a radical will and attempt to communicate, translation is about communication, is for you to be able to be understood by others, by other people. Uh, you know, grounded in their uh, respective context and cultures or what it's translation is is um, is also an act of sharing and you can share through communication and for people to understand they have to recognize some some, some things so I, I, I felt that um, in the English title I wanted a, a diaspora to to appear so diaspora or African I'd work the same for me I wanted black to appear I wanted journey uh, to appear um, to journey in terms of, um, you know, 
not only one point of departure, but points of departure, and, and not one point of arrival, but a destination or destinations uh, that remain you know, multiple and mysterious and unexpected. It's the journey that matters. It's not, it's not, the, the, not only the point of departure and the, and the point of arrival, it's the journey that, that leaves room for growth, that, that also implies uh, you know, the, the movements, uh, the multiple locations, uh, the transnationalism, uh, so I thought that journey was uh, uh, could work in that um, in that regard. So black is the journey, Africa the name, and then I, I wanted it to to sound beautiful. Uh, I wanted to I want beauty. I think beauty matters too and shouldn't be taken lightly. That and and it's so beautiful. <laughs> thank you. And and I think that um, it, I was not aware that I was so influenced by, um, you know, I'm a big fan of Arthur, uh, Arthur Jaffa's work. And uh, when I think of, um, you know, uh, love, love is the message, the message is death. Now I'm, 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 I'm thinking, did you have that in mind when you thought of, uh, you know, Black is the journey African and the name? But it really took me a while to, um, to realize that that's very recent. But I'm sure that there, there must be something of that because I find uh, Jaffa's work and his, and, and his titles always uh, beautiful. There was a documentary called uh, um, Our Nights Are Colder Than Death. Uh, so maybe there's a little Jaffa in that, but it was really um, unconscious. So Black is the Journey, African the name is really, um, was the way I found to communicate to English speaking audiences uh, to people who would be, you know, specializing in uh, African studies, or people who would have a greater uh, understanding of, you know, Atlantic studies, um, there, there would be some some words that they would that they would recognize and that they would um, enjoy or not. So, um, so yeah, um, that that was the title and the um, the translation itself. Of course, in English, it was very important because I do speak English and I was able to uh, closely collaborate with Kayama Glover, who, uh, you know, let me read every stage of the translation. And I was, uh, you know, lucky enough to, uh, uh, to have the conversation, to have her as a colleague, a collaborator, and a friend, and somebody I grew up with academically. Uh, so we could have those conversations. And I think that's the only language <laughs> with which it will happen. Any other language, I won't have the level to, um, you know, a knowledge of the language to, to work on that. But the thing that I should also say is that um, I, I started writing uh, writing the, the book, what was to become the book in English. I wrote the book, the first pages in English and from the US. I was in the US as a visiting uh, professor a few years ago. And I started work, uh, working on something that ultimately gave um, Le Triangle et l'Hexagone. And everything came in English first. Everything was easier in English. Everything, um, you know, flowed in English. So the the first um, twenty to thirty pages that I had, um, I presented them as work in progress in multiple um, U.S. university throughout the academic year, where I, I would get invitations, like in in NY, at NYU, UCLA, UPenn, uh, University of Virginia, to, to to name a few, and I was presenting this work in progress. And then I went, when I went back to France, La Découverte, the publishing house, asked me if I had a text that I wanted to develop. And I said, oh, you know, I have those pages that I've been working on and I'm just coming from the States. And, and then I showed them the, <laughs> those pages and they were like, fine, you know, fine. You, uh, you know, we are very, very interested. So we just need those pages in French. And that, that posed a big challenge for me. I, I couldn't, go from the English to the French. I couldn't translate myself, which means afterwards, you know, I, I thought about it. I, I couldn't, I don't know, own this, I don't know, this identity and location. If I was publishing in French, uh, talking about those racial and black matters, from France it meant that I was owning some part of my identity that had until then been very unclear, very unclear. So it, it really was an exercise for me to switch uh, from those first uh, pages written in English to French. And the help that I received to do so was um, 
came from my editor who said, why don't you write about why it's difficult for you to write in French? Try to write on that. And that, 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 that really uh, produced uh, the introduction. Sorry? It's a good editor. It's a great editor, like he understood me, <laughs> and 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 that um, that 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 eventually uh, uh, turned out to be the introduction. So this 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 uh, this comfort, this unease uh, with the French language was a reflection of uh, an unease, um, uneasiness uh, of uh, due to immigration, due to you know processes of racialization, blackness, and not belonging, being the, uh, the foreigner from within, and uh, you know, all these things. So that, that was also a matter of translation, sorry. No, absolutely. So I, I just want a quick follow-up question. Did everything you just described, did that also play into your decision to not translate your own French text into English? Because you could have done that yourself. Yes. Right? Yes. Didn't yes. Right. yes. Uh, thank you for this question, because the issue for me was to, um, to access some level of, of in, intimacy. Like, I was happy to have um, at least started finding my voice in French, and I wanted somebody to be able to explore their own voice in English. You know, so it was not about me being, it was not to be a performance. Uh, I speak English. You know, I've studied English, I've taught and written in English, and that's still a performance. That's that, that, as I said, the English language does not mean, I mean, I don't have any emotional connection. No, I do have an emotional connection, but it's not fraught. It's the, it's the language that I have chosen. It's not the, the, the language that, 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 that brings me back to a, a place, you know, a, a lost place of origin, or your parents, or your, you, you, you know, it's the thing that you, you choose as an individual and very freely. You, you, you know what I mean? And so I wanted somebody to be that comfortable with their own language to, um, to translate me. And, and I, I was interested in their, in, in their own performance, in their own mastery. And I think, okay, I'm a Glover. I mean, why would I, um, why, why would I not, um, draw or you know from um, the excellence of Kaya Maglova. I mean she's has, she's got uh, en France on dirait une belle plume. She's a beautiful writer. She's a beautiful writer and uh, and she's a, a scholar whose work I respect. So I was interested to to yeah perhaps that, that will also answer your question to tackle this project of translation as a collaboration as a new layer in that in that in that um, in that thing that I had begun. Not only, um, it was not so much about only having my words translated, it was also a reflection on how Kayama would understand, receive, and, and, and communicate those words. So, so, so to me, the, for the, the, the work to be translated, the book for, to be translated is um, an enrichment of, of the book. It's, it, it becomes another object, but enriched, yeah, you could compare the two versions and you could work on that. And then to have Sedia, uh, uh, you know, write the foreword, that's something, uh, some, um, something else that adds uh, interest and value. And I think that even like the, the foreword itself, the, the translator's note itself constitute something like on their own, they stand on their own and they can be uh, studied for what they are. And if they, they, they are studied with the book itself, then we get into this larger and larger and, you know, eternally enlarged conversation, which is the goal, which is the goal. It is the goal. Okay. Thank you so much. I have one more question for you, and then we can open uh, to, to launch into the Q&A part of today's event. Uh, but I think this question might actually, you know, um, prompt some questions from our participants. So, here it is. It's, it's connected to the previous question, but quite different. Uh, you acknowledge in the book, and I think it's something anyone really familiar with the field knows, that um, American academia, the state of Black studies uh, in American academia, is about 
50 years more advanced <laughs> than what's going on in France uh, <clears throat> at the moment uh, on the question of race and identity specifically. Um, the, the Americas, not just the US, the Americas, uh, is where most of the conceptual tools that, that we use to do this work uh, were forged and still get forged. But the exchange cannot be entirely one-sided because this is not how diasporic thinking uh, should work. And here I'm, I'm quoting actually Kaya McGlover's uh, translation note, quote, this translated work insists on the presence of Black friends in broader understandings of Blackness within the global community. It insists that US Blackness cannot stand in for the experience of the wider Black world, unquote. So my question for you is, in your opinion, what can US-based Black studies scholars, Africana studies scholars learn from the growing body of scholarship that is either produced in France slash Europe or focused on, on France slash Europe? What, what is in it, in this translation, what is in it for US-based scholars interested in those questions? I think that US-based scholars, if you know, because they are scholars, they should be interested in complexities, uh, in complexity, in nuances. So if we are seriously engaged with this African diaspora, we need to look at all the sides of the African diaspora. And I think that if you want to be, you know, to progress or to be cutting edge, then that you need to absorb or you need to come to terms understand and accept that Black Europe is a fact now, that Black Europe is perhaps the newcomer, it's the new kid on the block, but it's it's here. So as a scholar, you have a responsibility to be up to date. Uh, when I say that Black Europe is the newcomer, I mean that we are, we find ourselves in this historical, uh, you know, moment um, that follows the, you know, the, the, the migration waves of the, the 50s and 60s and 70s, the people who came from the former French empire or people who came from uh, what we call the overseas territories and regions who settled in hexagonal France and who had children there. And those children uh, are the new citizens and the new citizens of color who are present within hexagonal France, not only scattered throughout, you know, the, you know, the, the French empire, because this is, a, this is an empire <laughs> to this day, but who are present on uh, within this European part of France, people who are indigenous populations, like indigenous French populations of color. And this is a historical in terms of the number. I'm not saying that there were no black people in hexagonal France ever before. That's not true. We know there's a history. But now that, that, that the, the numbers um, that are being reached uh, these days are an, an, an evolution. And this evolution has consequences, means things, uh, you know, um, um, brings about all the conversations about citizenship, about francité, about laïcité, secularism, all the contemporary issues are tied to the outcome, to the result of those migration waves that take us back to the colonial history. So if you are a US-based uh, if you are a US-based, uh, you know, scholar, you need to follow up with the developments. So it's, it's, it's a new history. It's a history in the making, but it's a history that, 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 that matters. And that's it, just only because it exists, only because it exists. Uh, and let alone the fact that, uh, you know, the, um, let's say, supremacy or uh, that can be accounted for, the supremacy of the African-American experience or the, the US uh, you know, vision is tied to the um, supremacy of the U.S. So that's the paradox, and 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 what could be, an, um, you know, what could have been unexpected, at least to say that the United States of America, as a powerful, uh, you know, entity, as a mighty entity, even the minorities of this country are more powerful than other, uh, you know, minorities from other entities. And we know historically that the, what, what was to become the United States of America is actually one of the locations that received um, the, uh, the lowest number of enslaved Africans. Like out of the total transatlantic slave trade, five to seven percent arrived in North America and what was to become the United States. So it's like logically, historically, the African-American experience 
is um, um, a minority experience within the rest of the Americas. Like the African-American population is one of the most Creole populations, that is to say American-born populations. If you go to places such as Brazil, if you go even to the Caribbean, if you go to, um, yeah, let's say uh, Brazil uh, that absorbed alone almost 50% almost of the global trade, right? That, so, so African, African America, right, cannot be the uh, umbrella experience for Blackness, uh, neither in the Americas nor the world. But African America, because it is located within the United States, can benefit from the might, unexpectedly the might of the United States. And we can be careful about that because it's not only, you know, US-based scholars can include yourself, Noemi, or can include myself. We are the people who come from abroad and we can find, you know, um, you know, professional opportunities in the US. So we are also within that ivory tower and we can trouble the waters and we can, you know, remind people and that, that's fine. I mean, it's just a realization. It's just a... We all have degrees and levels of comfort of, uh, and, and no matter who we are, we need to be able to let them go and see that there are new things, simply. There are new things. I'm all for troubling the waters. Thank you, this was so eloquent. I think it's time to uh, open the floor to the Q&A. So um, Sierra might, I think we're going to remain pinned, but we'll be able to see everybody. So feel free to turn on your cameras, uh, everybody. If you want to uh, speak, I think you can, you know, raise your hand or just jump in. Uh, and while people are preparing their questions, maybe um, Maboula, you might be able to address the question asked by Arnaud Coulombel in the chat. What did your parents think about your book? Thank you, Arnaud, for this question. This is <laughs> oh, okay. So I um, I only have my mother alive. Um, so it's an interesting question because it's it's not. I don't think it's. Uh, I mean, Arnaud already know uh, knew that it was. It's not naive. Uh, so for my mother, who's uh, now spent over fifty years in in France, right? She's she 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 she's been in France for fifty years. Um, who really had a rough experience of immigration? Who um, who worked a lot, um, you know, uh, minimum wage jobs, you know, cleaning. Um, I mean, for for my mother, my life is really something that she dreamt of, something that was not. Um, it was simply not our lives. Uh, I'm living a life, the life of the people she used to work for, the people whose houses she cleaned, or uh, whose uh, offices uh, she cleaned. So, um, what did she think? She did not read it because she doesn't want to read it, because she thinks that she doesn't need to read it. She thinks that what matters is that her daughter published a book and that the name Sumoro appears on the cover of a book. So she really does not care. <laughs> she doesn't want to read it. Uh, she doesn't read anymore to begin with. She, she, she learned how to read and write and she used to read books when I was younger, but now she, she doesn't uh, uh, read, but she does crosswords. So for her, what matters is um, her to be able to display both versions of the book, the English and the, the, the French one, and say, my daughter writes books. That, that, that's it. And she, she's just happy to um, see me uh, on TV or see me, I don't know, respected, like I'm part of the, of the um, Villa Bertin right now. I'm, I'm one of the residents and she, she's like, you're the uh, inaugural resident of Villa Bertin at, uh, uh, you know, in Atlanta for the rest of eternity, and you're my daughter, and that's it. So I can tell people that my daughter is a resident. So it's, um, I used to not understand or accept, but now it, it makes more sense. I, I understand, um, you know, as a mother, and as a 
a woman who has experienced, uh, you know, immigration in the worst conditions as a poor woman, as an uprooted woman, to see your 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 children like achieve something, um, it's it's really a miracle. I'm, I'm more cynical, you know. My, my mother is is part of the parents who um. You know, you respect the teachers at school. You respect the you know the boss. You respect the president of the republic, whoever he was. He is. When I'm the one that I, I hate. Uh, the president or, you know, I don't respect the, the, the you, you know what I mean? We, I have a defiance towards uh, the institution that were never hers because it's like, you respect the people who are socially superior to you, right? So this defiance is, uh, is, is my privilege today. This questioning, this, um, uh, you know, being critical of everything and allowing myself to, I don't, I like this, I support that and I analyze that. That was not the case for the people who came to toil. The people who were in, let's say, in power are the people who were right. Those, you know, the people who were poor were the people who were wrong, who, who needed to do something to be accepted or to, you know, they had to raise their kids right. They had to be silent. They had to be, I don't know, clean and well raised. And, you know, that, that's one life. So it's uh, actually every time I'm asked about my parents' time, I get very emotional because. Um, um, I realized today that I might have been too harsh on some things, and now at um, perhaps because I'm getting more mature, but um, I do understand their, I better understand their worldview. They, so, so yes, this is what I can say. Sorry, my mom is happy because because I one of her daughters has a book out and 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 gets respected by white people. <laughs> Yeah, you're muted. Okay, thank you. I was I was muted and could not unmute myself. Thank you, Sierra, uh, for changing that setting. So I, the one thing I wanted to say, uh, just a quick follow up to the, the moving point you just made is that the book, and especially I'm thinking about the last 15 pages of the French version, which is where the the conceptual thrust of it, right? You you move from the biographical to the conceptual, really. I mean, conceptual is, is opening throughout, but this is where you give us the synthesis of it, right? The, the takeaway um, is adamantly insisting on the importance of um, developing an intersectional account of race in France. And you insist on gender, but you also insist a lot on class, right? And everything you just said about this relation to your mother, I find, you know, I find that reflected uh, in the in the um, intellectual work um, project that that this book uh, proposes. So, you know, an added added value of your reflection. Do we have more questions? Does anybody want to uh, turn on their camera and jump in? I see Khalid. Yes. Hi. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello, yes. Halid. Yes. Hello, Mabula. Uh, nice to virtually see you. Um, and thank you nice for this. <laughs> and thank you for this kind of, uh, I mean, very inspiring and moving introduction to your book. Um, so my name is Khalid Yamlahi, and I'm uh, actually I teach uh, Francophone studies. Um, I focus on North African literature. And I'm in the in the Department of Romance Languages and Literatures. Mm -hmm. um, I had I had actually two questions for you. The first one has to do with the medium and the genre of of this book. Um, and let me explain. I mean, I I I, wa I wanted to hear you. I mean, obviously, because since you are a scholar and this is an autobiographical work, so I wanted to hear you about like, um, do you think it matters to write? across different mediums and across different genres. Do you think that autobiographical works on, on or more broadly when you put you know, your personal experience to, into scholarship, do you think that adds and that actually achieves something that scholarship, let's say pure scholarship cannot mm -hmm. do? 
Um, mm. and, and, and especially in the current context, actually. So that's, that's my first question. Yes. And my, my second question has to do, I mean, I, I guess it has to do with audience, with, with your audience, and with, with actually violence. Because, I mean, Noemi pointed out earlier that we are now in this kind of phase in France where uh, the, the French presidential campaign and we are seeing this kind of increasing wave of violence and inability even to listen or to debate or to hear arguments. And it's extremely complicated just to kind of sit down and reflect on a couple of, you know, of issues. And you are mm -hmm. somebody who actually, you know, who you, you go to French media and you speak and you talk and you kind of, you, you also write and, and, and you wrote recently on Josephine Baker. Baker. So, I mean, I, I, I wanted to hear you about like, you know, um, violence and resistance and also kind of adjustments also an adaptation to your audience as you kind of navigate through this extremely tense and, and sometimes unproductive uh, settings. And thank you very much. I have plenty of other questions, yeah. <laughs> but I will thank stop you. here. <laughs> thank, no, you. thank you so much for, for both your questions, Khalid. They're very important questions and I think it's going to take me forever. <laughs> Wow. Um, so regarding the, the first question, right, we'll talk about the format. And uh, I didn't think of this book, I didn't think of Le Triangle and Hexagon as an autobiography. I don't know what it was. When I finished it, I didn't know what it was, but I knew that I wanted that it was what I wanted it to be. And it had to be a little this, a little bit of this and that. Just like when you, you study, you know, the diaspora, and, you, and one of the basic principles is that the model of the diaspora upsets and settles, challenges the, the model of the nation states, right? You need to accept the transnationalism, the internationalism. Um, I think that in, in what I was writing at that point, I also was going through borders, academic borders. I was, I was trying to do away with being, you know, trapped, imprisoned in, um, I don't know, is it supposed to be literature or history or cultural studies? I don't know, and I no longer care. You know, the, writing this book was really about being free. It's uh, drawing from, you know, the, the security, professional security, you know, thinking I have a PhD, I'm tenured. If you're tenured in France, you're actually a civil servant. So they can never get rid of you, right? So what's gonna happen now? When can I feel comfortable enough to do what I want to do, what interests me? not to conform, not to get the degree, not to get, I don't know, the prestige or the promotion. Well, if I want to express some things that really, you know, uh, uh, encompass all of me, what form will it take? And do know that now that I've done this, I am I'm already thinking that it's not it's not enough. Like I want I want other things now, you, you know. But I wanted to use the eye because I wanted to insert myself in the in the story, not solely you know not solely to uh, to talk about myself, but really to um, to to draw from uh, from myself um, to produce what I envision, what I perceive as academic knowledge too. I think this is valid. I mean, you can, you can talk, you can write about blackness, but you also need to understand your black body, your black body in, in, in the public sphere. And that's a valid approach to me. I cannot talk about, you know, you know black people this or people of African descent that as if I was not black. It's impossible. I am too. I am too. So what, what I mean by I am too is that I can be invited and that would serve as the transition to the, to the second question. I can be invited on um, you know, a TV set, mainstream TV, France Television, right? So uh, you know, very mainstream, very prestigious, prestigious, very legit. I go there to talk about, I don't know, inequalities, uh, injustices, racism, whatever you name it, the things that I talk about. And then when I go to the studio, after being given you know, clear instructions of where I need to present myself, who will take me to, to this or that location, the security guards at the you know, entrance, they don't want to let me in. 
they think they don't think that I'm a, a, a legit guest of the show. And it makes sense and it doesn't matter if the, the, the security guards are people of color. They know that usually on this TV show, the guests are mostly white. So if there's a black woman in front of them, she might be somebody who's trying to sneak in or she might be somebody who's part of the audience. She's not one of the real guests. You, you know what I mean? So these moments that can be anecdotes, right? They might, they might not mean anything in the larger analysis, but they do matter because they're part of my experience. I'm asked to come and talk about black people, but as a black person, people, um, people at the entrance gate, they tell me, are you sure? No, I think you need to use the other uh, entrance for the, for, for the guests because you're part of, uh, for the audience, you're part of the audience. No, sir, I'm a guest, I'm on the show. Are you sure? Let me call my supervisor and all these things. So what do you make of all those moments? What do you, it, it cannot only be about, you know, the statistics or the archives or the books or whatever it is. It's also on your, it, it's part of your life. It's part of your life. So I want you to be free enough to explore that and to have that kind of knowledge production accepted as uh, any other form. And I'm, I'm trying to explain my, um, you know, to explain to me, it's a very selfish book, to explain my, my, my life to myself using everything, using the scholarship, but also using everyday life. And to talk about the violence, you know, it is a hostile, it is a very hostile, um, you know, moment, but it's paradoxical because as, as I said earlier, the very reason why it is so violent is because the resistance is, is apparent. The resistance is, is more visible. Um, but you still need to nav navigate that violence. What I do is um, I come to the States. I accept invitations. I take breaks. Uh, I consider myself as a political exile for three months or one year. And then I, I, I come back to France rejuvenated because I, um, I have experienced firsthand, you know, scholars you know, from the US and from all over the world and from, from France as well, people who uh, went into exile and who are interested in those questions and with whom I can have conversations, with whom I can develop projects, uh, people of every color, people, you, you know what I mean? So it, it, it's, it, 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 it gives you time and space to breathe so that when you return to hexagonal friends, you can say, no, they're really, they, they, they're really crazy. They're really not seeing the world as it evolves. Uh, you know, now that I've, I, I, I've been able to step aside from, for a second, I've met other human beings, other scholars who are doing work. No, I'm, I'm, I'm fine. So then you're ready to, go, to do the work and you know, you know you're right. You, you don't know when you're gonna win, but you know that, that we're gonna win. That's, it's just the world. Uh, it might not, the victory might not uh, occur during my lifetime, but I know that I'm not crazy. And that, and that, that's, that, that really does a lot because those uh, type of settings can drive and have driven people crazy, insane. They attack your mental health. And there's a vi violence on the moment. You know, you have to uh, withstand the moment, the questions, the, the, the criticisms and the, the lies, the bad faith. And then there's the aftermath of the moment and the social network, uh, the threats, the mail you receive, the, um, you know, the, yes, the threats. And that's constant, that's real. It's not so much, it's not um, exposing yourself. To me, exposing myself is not fun. It's really, it's, it's really my activism because I don't consider myself as an activist. I'm not part of a, a political party or an, or an organization, but I do understand that showing your face and your body as a black woman, uh, as a French black woman of African descent on media, you know, during, in the mainstream media is an act of resistance. I can tell you that, uh, Khalid, that sometimes I talk to people <laughs> Uh, you know, it can be radio or TV, and I know the way they look at me or the way they talk to me, they still cannot get over the fact that this Black woman is talking to them. We're not even having a, a conversation, a, a debate of ideas. They just don't understand why their cleaning lady is being so cheeky right now. You, you know what I mean? They don't, like, it's, they... 
they don't, they, oh, I don't know. We're still at that stage. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Are, you, are you a real PhD? Oh, uh, are you a real French person? Can, can, do, can you read and write? We are at that stage. The book, the book, you have some amazing pages where you describe that kind of aggression that you get uh, on TV sets, right? When people don't really um, question your credentials, you know, for, for, you know, no other reason than the color of your skin. Um, you also make it clear in the book that somehow violence finds you, right? You talk about that hate mail that you got when you just started your, when you took your current academic position some 10 years ago, you were not on TV sets then, this was oh. not presidential campaign and violence finds you. So yeah. if that's how it's gonna be, you might as well do the work, right? Exactly. Um, you might as well be free. Right, and I, and I wanted to add also this, this uh, question the, of the, the toll that this work takes on the mental health of black women. I've had the exact same conversation with Bintou Dembele, whom you know well, uh, and yes. who, was, uh, who was on our campus just a couple of months ago, uh, also as part of a residency program. Um, and, and this is a conversation I've had with Kim Hall, so also with African-American uh, scholars. All Black feminists agree that this work takes its toll. Uh, and it's, I, yes. I'm so glad that there are ways of taking care of yourself and that somehow coming to the US is part of this. Yes, and, and receiving invitations like yours, like you don't understand. I mean, I'm sure you suspect, Noemi, that these are the good times. These are the quiet times. These are the valued times because I'm exchanging with people who have read the book, who understand the book, and who can also take me further in the reflections, who can challenge me, and who can you know, offer a critique, but a critique that is welcome, that is normal for any book. You're not asking me to explain myself and to define every single word that I use. So that's, that's very, um, um, I don't know, that's, that, that's very, um, come on, dear. I don't know why I'm losing my English right now. I'm not, good. I'm, I'm not used to so much happiness. No, but that's very good. To, to, I appreciate that a lot because otherwise you can have conversations in France that are framed in a, in a way that, um, that make, makes you think that we're, we're not even thinking right now. We are fighting. This is so political. We are fighting. I'm interested. I'm a scholar. I'm, 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 I'm interested in, 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 in thoughts. Right now, I know the level where we find out we are fighting. This is so political. You want the woman to shut up. You want the black woman to disappear. You want the black woman to be inferior. I know that, mm. right? Or you want to maintain you know, the order of things. You want to maintain your privileges. I'm in, interested in thinking and I'm interested in diaspora, in blackness. What does it mean? How difficult it is? Why is you know uh, African America so um, different from you know Black Europe? Why is Brazil that way? Why do we speak so many languages? That's my job. This is what I would like to do freely. Yeah. So, Mabula, just a quick logistical question. We are running over time, uh, but we do have a question in the chat, and there might be another question in the audience. Are you willing to take a couple more questions? Yeah, yes, yes. Okay, thank you. <laughs> okay, so we have a question in the chat from uh, Takesha Harrison. Are your conversations different when you speak at HBU schools? Thank you. Ah. Takisha, thank you for your question. I'm going, I'm, I'm, I'll, I'll be able to answer your questions only um, when, I, when, I, when I go there. So uh, I was lucky enough to be invited to the you know, United College Negro Fund uh, annual um, you know, Congress um, some time ago, like five years ago in Atlanta. And this, this three months, because I'm based in Atlanta, I'm gonna do a lot of uh, HBCUs talks and I'll see what the conversations will be about. Because this will be the opportunity to meet, of course, the colleagues, but also the students. When last time I was, it was in Atlanta, but only with colleagues. So I'm really looking forward to doing that. And I'm, I've been, um, you know, in very insisting with the Villa Albertine that I was going to go to the HBCUs and that was part of the deal uh, for me to come in Atlanta. So I'm looking forward to those, to those conversations, but I'm not, um, I'm not worried. I'm not worried. Do we have more questions from, so we have one more question from Arnaud in the chat, but uh, folks in the room who have not dropped their question in the chat, if you want to, Speak now or forever be quiet. No, don't be quiet. Ever. Ever. Uh, 
<laughs> Larry has a question for you, Mabula. Sure. Thank you. This has been fascinating. Uh, I'm Larry Norman. Hey, Larry. I'm in Romance Languages also here. Uh, nice to meet you. Uh, wonderful to meet you virtually. And uh, it picks up on, on a lot of what you said, and particularly, you know, talking about your media appearances and so on. But I wondered if you could say more about the reception of the book for those who actually will take it seriously or, you know, have dealt with it as a book in France. And I know it's just come out in America, so it may be too early, but if there's any comparisons there, and um, I guess I'm also interested, you don't have to take this line, but the degree to which uh, Americanization has been talked like that you have been Americanized in some way, but you may not want to go in that direction. I'm just very curious as to your your reaction to the reactions uh, in France. <laughs> Thank you so much for, for all your questions and comments, Larry. So to talk about the reception of the book uh, by a French audience, uh, there are several uh, aud groups of audience, uh, I would say. So when the book uh, first came out, there were, um, there were a number of people who, um, you know, follow, already followed me or supported me on the, you know, social network. And those are the people who, uh, who came to the book launch and who were going to, um, to buy the book no matter what, who asked me to write a book before. So, and, and these people can be, of course, families and friends, uh, but they can also be, you know, activists, students, uh, colleagues uh, who are doing more or less the same thing. So that was kind of a, the granted audience. And then the book came out and it was, um, it was uh, uh, you know, covered and uh, critiqued by the mainstream. So it was interesting. <laughs> there were several things. There, were, there are several things to say. First, the victory could be, that was not my point of view, but for the publishing house, it could be to be, to get an article in this or that newspaper or to be mentioned in that radio show or to be, you know, invited to that TV show and to, to have the, the cover of the book, uh, you know, flashed on the screen. That's already a victory. Um, but what people say about the book is, is, another, is another story because my main issue was that from, in the mainstream, I oftentimes felt that, that we did not speak the same language. That we, you know, it was not satisfying intellectual conversations. You, you know, it, it was, um, it could be nice, it could be open, but it was not deep. It was not deep. And I think that it's not deep because people do not have this knowledge. People don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, so sometimes, uh, you know, I've heard journalists say, you know, I want to know more about, you know, the author talks about her research and I want to know more about her research. Why didn't she pro provide a bibliography of footnotes? And because I'm talking to you about my master's thesis and that was 20 years ago, I'm done with that. And why should I give you everything? I, I, I give enough information in the book for you to go and look up for other things. And I don't wanna waste time to rehash things that I've worked on for so long and then I've moved. So if you don't know anything about, uh, you know, the creation of Liberia, you don't know anything about Marcus Garvey, you don't know anything about, you know, Rastafari, the nation of Islam, uh, if you don't know who Sedia Hartman is, how can we talk? You're gonna cling to the things you're familiar with. It's like, what do you mean blackness? Aren't, you, aren't we all human beings? Are you a racialist? Were you trained in the US? Are you an Americanist? You know, yeah, like you're, you're so American. So Noemi Ndiaye, Dr. Noemi Ndiaye, currently teaching at the University of Chicago, uh, a, a French person, is she an American now? What she writes about is due to her newly acquired Americanness. How stupid is that? So to talk about and to you know denounce this Americanization to me is a demonstration, is a full display of the ignorance of U.S. academia. Within U.S. academia, you find the world. So yes, I have been trained by U.S. scholars, but I've been trained by African scholars, Caribbean scholars. European scholars, 
when I was in when I was a graduate student in the states, and now when I come to the to the state and I and I teach myself. So for one year, I'm part of U.S. academia. Am I French? Am I Ivorian? Am I black? Am I? These are the questions that I'm dealing with intellectually. This is these are the intellectual questions. What do the you know what do all these labels mean? What matters? Am I French? Am I Ivorian? Am I black? Am I a woman? Am I everything at the same time? So you 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 know what I mean? This uh, so in France it's um, yeah. I have colleagues who are doing work and who've been doing uh, uh, work for a long time. So most of the time, what we have in common is that we all have been students or teachers in the States at some point. <laughs> and, and now uh, that we are all based in France and they invite me and these are the people I trust. But I have to say that the most, the most um, consistently interesting questions and conversations happen, still happen in the States, except for my, you know, the group of people who are, who've moved back and forth. Uh, in France, we um, I feel like a, you feel like a teacher because you're 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 teaching them. <laughs> they, you know, you the the Black Atlantic, the Black At Atlantic by by Paul Giroy was translated in French, um, I think, in the in the 2010s. Mm -hmm. you, you know what I mean? Um, Achille Bembe is a superstar right now. But uh, on the post colonies is from 2000, uh, so, and it's only now that there's an interest. So you, you, that, that's our pace, right? And so the challenge, as as you you beautifully put it, is to do this work, right? <laughs> Just you have to do the fight first, right? Uh, go through this fight, and the challenge is how to do that, and at the same time grow, right? Grow. Yes. And scholars in France who can, as you said earlier, move those conversations forward rather than yeah. just put them on the map over and over again, just, you know, again. push them forward. Yes. Um, exactly. Mabula, this was illuminating and there are um, piles of comments and, you know, uh, that express gratitude that I think, I mean, I hope you, have, you, you can take a minute to read the comments in the, in the Q&A, but um, we are at time. I have so many more questions for you talking about, you know, moving those questions forward. I, if we had time, I would want to ask you about the role of historical archives in your work, because being an early modernist myself, I could not help but notice echoes of Montaigne, right? This, this yes. entire genre, I am the matter of my own book. This, this is so deeply French in that early modern tradition, uh, echoes of Descartes, of Shakespeare. So I would want to talk about that with you. I would also want to talk about how you think of you know, the potential alliances with other racialized people in France, right? How do we work across those racial lines with uh, uh, French folks of Asian descent, of North African descent and so on, right? So, so much more to talk about. Um, and I think all of that just proves that you have to actually come to us. We, we, we need that, to- That was my conclusion too. Yeah. No, I think we agree on that. that uh, we're, we're going to take it yeah, out. We, have, we have to come. To, there's no other way to uh, Chicago. And, right. And, uh, you will you know. be in Atlanta in through until the beginning of February, right? To the end of January. I'm leaving like on the 31st. Yeah. Okay. And you will be very busy, but never mind. We will find a way to make it work. Because I also want to hear more about the project you're working on right now at the Ville yes. d'Albertine, right? This multimedia adaptation process, which is another way of handling, re revisiting the, the translation question. But of course, it hasn't taken place yet. You're about to do that work. So maybe yeah. later on, at some point in spring, we could find a way to get you Sorry. to visit us and, <laughs> and explore all those questions. And, and we need to meet in person, though, I mean, this is getting ridiculous ridiculous at this point. We need to meet, so it, it doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, well, I want to thank you again, Mabula, for taking the time to, to talk to us today. Uh, Le Triangle de so Paradigm Shifting Book um, and its English translation. Um, Black is the Journey, Africana, the name now available for order uh, at Polity. And I think Sierra dropped the link earlier on in the chat. So you can uh, go there directly to order the book. Mabula, à la prochaine. À la prochaine, Noemi. Thank you so much for your invitation. Thank you, everyone, for 
attending. Thank you for the questions and looking forward to meeting all of you on uh, campus at some point. I don't despair at some point.